This module explores research principles as applied to the paramedic provider. Once completed with this module, you should be able to discuss medical research, recognize the importance of research in EMS, define types of research, describe ethical considerations in research, discuss literature review, define statistical concepts related to research, relate research concepts to EMS, and discuss evidence-based decision-making. If you recall from the History of EMS module, EMS really began to develop in the United States in the 1960s. Relatively speaking, EMS is still a somewhat young profession compared to other medical disciplines. One shortcoming of the system that has emerged since that time was that EMS routinely provided care and treatment to victims of illness and injury with little or no evidence that the care provided was optimal. This led to the publishing of the National EMS Research Agenda in late 2001. Supported by NHTSA and the Maternal Child Health Bureau, the National EMS Research Agenda called for EMS as a profession to elevate the science of EMS and pre-hospital care by examining innovative ways to deliver treatment and care. Essentially, formalized medical research was recognized as the means by which the system could be evaluated and improved. From a high-level view, medical research begins with someone asking a question, identifying a topic for examination, or proposing a hypothesis on a subject related to a medical practice. Such an example may be a physician asking why EMS longboards everyone when the first thing they do at the ED upon delivery of the patient is remove all of the immobilization devices. From this simple start of asking a question, the researcher can develop a research agenda that denotes questions to be asked, the goal of the research study, and the means by which the research will be conducted. This is important to keep the researcher focused, as a seemingly simple question can often raise other questions that would compound and complicate the potential research. As part of this process, the researcher must also determine where and how the research will be conducted, being mindful of addressing ethical and legal considerations that would apply. Maybe the researcher is planning on performing a literature review of previous related studies that may apply to the realm of EMS. On the other hand, the researcher may be thinking about a blind study involving the administration of a specific medication to certain patients that meet specific inclusion criteria. Research studies can vary considerably in scope and application depending on that research agenda. Once a study is carefully defined, adequate funding is arranged, regulatory approvals are received, and active study participants are ready, the collection of data may begin. Once all of the data is collected, which could take a considerable period of time, the data must be evaluated so that conclusions may be formed. The last step is to have the research published in a peer-reviewed medical journal. At its simplest, medical research may be performed by reviewing the existing body of medical knowledge related to the topic in question. This means performing a literature review. For medical research to be considered valid, however, it must be published in a peer-reviewed publication that adequately scrutinizes the study and the results, including its limitations. This level of scrutiny is significant and is easily differentiated from other trade publications that may profess to foster research and learning, but are not recognized as definitive authorities on research topics given the lack of peer review scrutiny. Within the realm of EMS, Pre-Hospital Emergency Care is the official peer-reviewed journal of the National Association of EMS Physicians, the National Association of State EMS Officials, the National Association of EMS Educators, and the National Association of EMTs. While there are numerous other EMS periodicals and professional publications available for review, research studies must be published in this peer-reviewed journal to be considered authoritative for the purposes of modifying medical practices and protocols within the pre-hospital environment. If a research study is being reviewed, be sure to do so with a critical eye. An interesting thing about research in general is that not everyone always agrees with the researcher's findings. Sometimes there are variances that may not have been considered, the parameters associated with the research do not translate directly into other agencies, the number of data points was limited, some type of researcher bias may have been present, or another research study has a conflicting outcome or conclusion. Research with glaring holes should not be published in a peer-reviewed journal, but that does not mean that all published research studies are airtight. 
Essentially, the more studies there are that support the same outcome or conclusion on the same topic, the more valid those holdings or results will be within the profession. If you can correlate multiple studies with the same outcome, subsequent changes to your operations based upon that body of evidence will be much more prudent than if you only found one questionable study in a periodical that is not peer-reviewed. Essentially, as already mentioned, the researcher must have a conceptual framework in mind when proposing a research study. We will delve deeper into the various aspects of medical research in just a little bit. Additionally, while it was already alluded, every research study has its limitations. These inherent limitations are important to recognize when working with formalized medical research as the application of the research may not apply in a different environment or scenario. For example, there is a lot of research on trauma care from the military that is often applied to civilian EMS. The limitations of such data, however, is that the environment in which EMS is practiced is often very different than that in which the military is functioning. Would that impact the usefulness of that research to your particular EMS agency? That depends on the nature of the research and just how different the environments may be. There are a lot of ways research can be categorized. One of the most common is to look at the type of data that will be gathered as a part of the research project. When broken down by this criteria, research is divided into two categories, quantitative research and qualitative research. Quantitative research is essentially research based upon numbers, numeric data. Such research typically results in statistical analysis and pretty charts to summarize the results. Quantitative research methods are further broken down into additional categories. The first is experimental research, in which the researcher conducts an experiment by manipulating or changing a variable to see the impact on the measured results. Such research evaluates cause and effect relationships between the impacted variable and the outcome. Non-experimental research is more observational in nature, as the researcher cannot intentionally change or experiment with research variables. Data can be gathered, but any changes in underlying variables must be natural or organic, as they cannot be controlled by the researcher. Lastly, survey research uses survey results from participants to draw conclusions for a larger population. In such research, defining an appropriate sample size is important to be able to extrapolate the results out for the larger population. In contrast to quantitative research is qualitative research. Qualitative data is typically more subjective than the hard and fast numbers generated by quantitative research. Qualitative data can be difficult to measure with exactness as the research is attempting to garner the human element within the collected data. Such data may consist of narrative descriptions, individual perceptions, open-ended responses to specific survey questions, Likert-type scales, and other non-numeric information. Focus groups, open-ended surveys, and the evaluation of other documents and records are common data gathering techniques in qualitative research. The resulting data is typically compiled through the identification of common themes, which is summarized and then interpreted by the researcher within the context of the study. As mentioned previously in other modules, EMS is considered a healthcare profession and, when research is conducted, it typically involves actual people our patients. While it should probably go without saying, EMS providers must be advocates for and protect the best interests of their patients, and this applies within the realm of research as well. Any research studies conducted by an EMS agency that involves human subjects must be ethically administered while also meeting numerous regulatory requirements. Unfortunately, if history has shown us anything, it is that the ethics part of human research is sometimes a sliding scale and many have rationalized harm to individuals under study by presumably convincing themselves that the ends justify the means. In some cases, the intent of the researchers may have even been more dubious. For additional information on some of the most infamous research studies involving human subjects, feel free to look up Unit 731, Nazi Human Experimentation the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, and the Stanford Prison Experiment, to name just a few. A Google search on unethical human experimentation yields even more examples of medical and psychological research on human patients that resulted in significant harm to those being studied. Given a history of human research atrocities, Congress passed the National Research Act of 1974, which created the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. 
Two years later, in 1976, the Commission published the Belmont Report, which summarizes basic ethical principles that should underlie the conduct of biomedical and behavioral research involving human subjects while also providing guidelines to ensure such research is conducted in accordance with those principles. These ethical principles are summarized as respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Respect for persons recognizes that everyone should be treated as an autonomous person with the right to make decisions for him or herself. Within the realm of research, this means that human participants must be uncoerced to participate. Stated another way, the participants must freely volunteer to participate in the research or study. Such voluntary participation must be based upon a full disclosure of risks and benefits to the human subject. Essentially, the human subject must consent to participation in the study with full knowledge of both the risks and benefits of participating. Lastly, the human participant must have the right to withdraw from the research at any time. Additionally, respect for persons also recognizes that some people lack the capacity for self-determination and they must be protected from activities that will or could potentially harm them. Similar to other discussions in the EMS realm regarding consent and the capacity of a patient to provide or withhold consent, if an individual lacks capacity to consent to care in a typical EMS context, that person obviously would lack capacity to participate in a research study. Unlike consent to treatment, however, there is no implied consent that would apply within a research context as there is within the delivery of routine emergency medical care. Consent to participate in research must be informed consent, otherwise it is not considered valid. Beneficence is an affirmative duty to respect the decisions of others, protect them from harm, and make efforts to secure their well-being. Summarized another way, the researcher is bound to do no affirmative harm while maximizing possible benefits and minimizing possible harms. The challenge this presents in research is that there may be cases where a researcher does not actually know what is or could be harmful to the subject. Thus, the requirement to minimize risk is a critical one. Is there a point where potential benefits outweigh the risks? That is the crux of this particular ethical principle with which many still struggle. Lastly, justice looks at the balancing act between who ought to receive the benefits of research and who bears the burden of such research. In some instances, this particular element touches on societal norms and concerns by looking at the exploitation of certain populations, such as those with lower socioeconomic status, or the need for research to benefit those who need it, not just those who can afford it. To help researchers comply with these ethical requirements, most research is conducted under the watchful eye of an institutional review board, commonly referred to simply as an IRB, which must approve the research before human subjects are involved. Additional continuing review may also be required depending on the nature of the research. Broadly speaking, any research related to subjects covered by a federal regulatory department or agency must have an IRB that complies with the requirements as denoted in 45 CFR Part 46. The Federal Department of Health and Human Services Office for Human Research Protections is ultimately responsible for enforcement of these federal regulations. Within a healthcare environment, the Food and Drug Administration is commonly recognized as having strict research requirements that go well beyond the IRB requirement within the Health and Human Services regulations. Other ethical considerations that must be addressed in research includes ensuring the researcher avoids conflicts of interest between his or her own personal benefits or possible gains with the research being conducted, as well as a need to ensure all data is reported accurately, even if the data does not support the results for which the researcher was hoping. Beyond research that involves human subjects, another type of research that is common within various disciplines is that of a literature review. When faced with a potential research question, the researcher should first check to see if the research has already been performed. That entails what is known as a literature review. Essentially, the researcher looks through numerous resources such as peer-reviewed publications, government publications, and other resources commonly available through a library or an online literature search engine to find published research and other information related to the topic in question. For example, an EMS researcher may be curious as to what type of airway adjunct is the best to use in a pre-hospital setting. 
By conducting a literature review, the researcher will find numerous studies that evaluated the effectiveness of various airway adjuncts, including non-visualized supraglottic airways and endotracheal tubes. By combing through research that is already available, the researcher may very well be able to answer his or her question on the particular topic he or she was researching. If there is no research on the topic, however, or the available research is not conclusive, that may prompt the researcher to begin exploring the need to conduct original, new, or expanded research on the topic in an effort to answer whatever question prompted the researcher to begin his or her search in the first place. One word of caution for the researcher conducting a literature review is to ensure the resources used in the literature review are indeed reliable, accurate, and verifiable resources. Peer-reviewed journals are great sources of research, whereas an online blog by a private party is not, although such resources may still be of value if they cite their sources, which the researcher can then use to find additional information that may indeed be valid and reliable. Trade publications are typically not considered to be valid sources for a literature review, although such publications may refer to published research, which can assist the researcher in finding those original resources. Ultimately, the goal of formalized research is to answer some type of question which requires both the collection and analysis of data. In analyzing that data to form a conclusion or opinion, statistical concepts must be employed by the researcher. In this respect, there are two types of statistics that are often used by researchers, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics are used to summarize a collection of like data, typically through the use of a graph. Within the EMS realm, reporting call volume by time of day is a simple example of descriptive statistics. Essentially, you have a finite collection of data and descriptive statistics help you convey the interpretation of that data to an audience. Central tendency, the average or median, dispersion, variance, whether the data is skewed one particular direction, percentages, and other statistical measures are common tools within the realm of descriptive statistics. Inferential statistics, on the other hand, tries to extrapolate results for an entire population given just a small sample of that population. In this respect, think about exit polling by news agencies. The graphic included as an example here shows the results from a CNN poll in 2014 that asked people whether they thought the economy was in good or poor condition. Obviously, CNN cannot poll every single American to determine the actual percentage for each category. Rather, it uses inferential statistics to infer the results within a given margin of error, plus or minus 3% in this case, to the entire population. For this particular survey, CNN conducted telephone interviews with 1,012 adult Americans. The estimated population for the United States in 2014 was approximately 318.6 million. So how can CNN poll or sample such a small number of people and apply that to the population as a whole? they used inferential statistics. When determining how many people to sample, CNN had to look at the population as a whole, the parameters of the study, the necessary sample size for the polling, and the statistical sampling error associated with these various numbers along with the desired or resulting statistical significance of the research. As far as our discussion regarding the application of research concepts to EMS is concerned, there are numerous topics that should be considered. To begin, NHTSA published the National EMS Research Agenda in late 2001, and many of the items discussed within that document still apply through today. Within the abstract, the National EMS Research Agenda recognizes that, despite decades of EMS practice, the treatment of patients occurs with little to no evidence of its benefit or that the treatment is optimal. The document then goes on to make several recommendations related to research in EMS, some of which are included here. First, it is recognized that EMS needs to develop researchers within the profession. As many educational institutions of higher learning already have professional researchers within their employ, collaborating with those institutions, along with other healthcare organizations, hospitals in particular, would be of tremendous benefit to EMS within the context of conducting research within the profession. A great example of these efforts within Wisconsin would be the nexus between Milwaukee County EMS, Frederick Hospital, and the Medical College of Wisconsin. The collaboration of these different entities within the realm of EMS research is a model worthy of replication in other areas. 
As far as that research is concerned, there are several domains in which the profession could benefit from research. These domains include clinical practice, the development and management of EMS systems, and EMS education. Within these domains, it is important that the research addresses specific problems and questions so that the research can drive actual practice. Clinical studies are a great example of how research can help drive improvement in patient outcomes. Recent examples of such studies are those related to spinal immobilization or the use of endotracheal tubes versus other non-visualized supraglottic airways. The American Heart Association conducts research all the time on best practices for CPR and ACLS, which, in turn, drives routine updates to emergency cardiovascular care guidelines in the hopes of improving patient outcomes. Many educational institutions are beginning to delve into EMS research, with the UCLA Center for Pre-Hospital Care being a nationwide leader in these efforts with its Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum. Private entities like FISDAP are often involved in these educational research efforts as well. One big challenge in EMS research that comes up often is funding. Someone may have a great idea for a research study, but how do they pay for it? Luckily, if an agency is truly interested in conducting research to solve problems or answer questions within the realm of EMS, several funding mechanisms may be available. These funding streams may include public funding, corporate support, grant or other funding through various foundations, and even the federal government in some instances. One successful research model that has been employed in EMS was that of forming a research consortia. By pulling together various organizations such as private companies, healthcare providers, EMS agencies, and even governmental entities, formalized research opportunities may grow given the consolidation of resources across all of the consortium partners. As mentioned previously, sound research is based upon data. Therefore, the collection of data is critical to effective EMS research. Depending on the type of research being conducted, historical data within a patient database may be adequate to help answer the research question. Such data could be available through hospitals, EMS agencies, or even governmental databases such as the Wisconsin Ambulance Run Data System. Being able to link the data between these various databases can admittedly be a problem, however. EMS agencies looking for patient outcome data, for instance, may be challenged in obtaining that information from the various hospitals to which it transports, especially if those various data systems are not linked and requests for information are manual, which also means any correlation of data must also be manual. Despite some of these challenges, however, research is critical for the advancement of the profession. If EMS providers want to improve services to grow as a healthcare profession, conducting formalized research is a necessity. Regardless of what entities are involved in conducting EMS research, regulatory issues must always be addressed. One of the biggest challenges EMS has to conducting research is that the human subjects commonly involved do not have adequate time to provide full, informed consent to participating in research. Depending upon the scenario, the patient may also lack capacity or may feel pressured to participate given the emergent nature of his or her circumstances. It is with these emergent situations in mind that the Federal Department of Health and Human Services recognizes a process by which IRBs may apply an emergency research consent waiver when certain criteria apply, and even issued a Dear Colleague letter in 1996 on the topic that is available on the hhs.gov website. The human subjects in such a study must be in life-threatening situations, available treatments are unproven or unsatisfactory, and the collection of valid scientific evidence is necessary to determine the safety and effectiveness of particular interventions. Obtaining informed consent must not be feasible given the circumstances. Participation in the research could provide a direct benefit to the subjects, and the research could not be practicably carried out without the waiver. If informed consent is reasonable under the circumstances, then the waiver should not apply to those circumstances. If the waiver is applied, the research must be certain to provide additional protections for the rights and welfare of the subjects. 
we cannot discuss medical research without also recognizing the patient privacy provisions within the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, commonly referred to as HIPAA. While HIPAA does allow for disclosures of protected health information without consent in various circumstances, healthcare entities, including EMS agencies, must still protect that information and ensure the disclosure meets minimum necessary requirements. When evaluating research projects involving medical patients, IRBs should ensure the research complies with HIPAA requirements as well as all ethical requirements we previously mentioned. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services also has an Office of Research Integrity tasked with overseeing and directing public health service research integrity activities on behalf of the Secretary of Health and Human Services. If public health service research is being conducted with federal dollars or oversight through various federal agencies, such as the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Health Resources and Services Administration, and others, the ORI is the agency responsible for handling misconduct inquiries and investigations, as well as ensuring institutional compliance with IRB requirements. While the ORI may not be involved in oversight of EMS research on a regular basis, if a federal public health service entity is involved in the research, the ORI and its assurance and compliance program is responsible for monitoring institutional compliance with the PHS policies on research misconduct. Ultimately, with all of these various topics in mind, EMS researchers must both establish and adhere to the research agenda approved by the IRB or other body governing the research. While we touched on this briefly earlier, it bears repeating. Traditional medical practice is based upon medical knowledge, intuition, and judgment. Of these three components, research seeks to expand the medical knowledge basis for EMS providers. Ultimately, high-quality patient care should focus on procedures that are proven to be useful in improving patient outcomes. Inversely, procedures that provide little to no benefit should probably be discontinued, and any procedure that actually causes harm should be stopped. This is one of the compelling arguments that has been made recently with regard to longboarding everyone in EMS. This is a practice that has been the standard of care for decades, but emerging research has begun to demonstrate very little benefit to longboarding trauma patients while recognizing increasing and arguably unacceptable risks associated with the practice. Given very little benefit and a higher risk of harm than previously recognized, many medical directors are removing longboard use from spinal immobilization protocols instead of opting for selective spinal immobilization protocols. Another similar discussion is the use of endotracheal tubes instead of other supraglottic non-visualized airways for airway management in the emergency field setting. As research continues to demonstrate better outcomes with less errors given the use of supraglottic non-visualized airways when compared to endotracheal tubes, many ALS services are moving away from endotracheal intubation entirely. Despite these examples, however, the historic problem with using evidence-based decision-making within EMS was the lack of pre-hospital emergency care research. Remember from earlier modules that EMS evolved out of military practices and some military research continues to drive EMS practices, such as those related to gunshot and stabbing wounds within an active assailant scenario. Many of those practices continued over the years because that is just what EMS has always done. In other cases, procedures were added because they felt right without any support from objective data proving that those procedures or interventions are indeed helpful or positive. Given the nature of emergency services, the unscheduled nature of EMS contacts, the short time frames with which EMS typically interacts with patients, the reliance of volunteers with limited time and training in many rural and even some suburban settings, lack of formalized training in conducting medical research, and challenges with bridging various databases between different healthcare entities, conducting pre-hospital research within an EMS agency can be extraordinarily difficult. Even with these pressing challenges in mind, EMS must continue to make efforts to perform research and utilize evidence-based decision-making to move the profession forward for the benefit of the patients we serve. As far as an evidence-based decision-making technique is concerned, the steps are relatively straightforward. The researcher must formulate a question about appropriate or inappropriate treatments. The researcher must then conduct a literature review to see if related research already exists. Such evidence must be appraised for validity and reliability. 
If such evidence does not exist, then the researcher may have to look at actually conducting a research project to obtain the data related to the formulated question. Regardless of where the data comes from, so long as the data is valid, reliable, and supports a change in practice, the agency should then adopt the new treatment, practice, or therapy while keeping unique patient needs in mind. That, in a nutshell, is how evidence-based decision-making should work within EMS. Decisions should be driven by data to improve the patient experience and outcomes. In all cases, research is a necessary component to obtaining that evidence, whether it be through a literature review or an actual research project. As we conclude this module, it is important to recognize that professional researchers typically have a master's degree or a doctorate. With that in mind, the short introductory module to EMS research principles is hardly adequate to prepare anyone to be a researcher. For those who are interested in performing research within an EMS environment, additional education is a necessity. Keep in mind as well our discussion regarding collaborative partnerships. Working with educational institutions and healthcare institutions within your response area can be a great way to develop an EMS-centric research project. Even if your formal education falls short of a research-related degree, partnering with other institutions and individuals with those credentials and associated resources can yield some sensational research to help further high-quality EMS care in the pre-hospital environment. In summary, given your completion of this module, you should now be able to discuss medical research, recognize the importance of research in EMS, define types of research, describe ethical considerations in research, discuss literature review, define statistical concepts related to research, relate research concepts to EMS, and discuss evidence-based decision-making within an EMS agency. This presentation was prepared by Waukesha County Technical College in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, and is distributed with an attribution non-commercial share alike 4.0 International Creative Commons license, Copyright 2018, Waukesha County Technical College. For more information on WCTC's numerous fire and EMS educational offerings, please visit us online at wctc.edu.